human creativity is astounding. We've built everything from skyscrapers to spaceships. We've designed complex transport systems and pioneered remarkable technology. And with all these achievements to our name, we humans believe we're much more advanced than animals. But are we? The truth is, animals are better than us at many things and often developed their abilities millions of years before we did. So are we humans really innovative or mere copycats? As this series investigates, nearly everything we think we invented, animals did it first. When it comes to warfare, we humans have been particularly creative. Some one and a half million years ago, we'd learnt to make simple weapons out of wood, bone and stone. Today, our weaponry is only limited by our imagination. Mankind has been very resourceful at picking a fight. Swords, spears, guns, germ warfare. We even play war games like paintball. Animals have been just as inventive, and most of our weapons have an equivalent in nature. In nature's battlefield, the rule is hunt or be hunted, and the killer comes in many forms, from the stormtrooper to the silent assassin. Guns are the most common tool used in the human arms race. But in nature, it's teeth. Mammals possess three types. Incisors for slicing, molars for grinding, and canines for piercing flesh. Crocodiles swallow their prey whole, so they need only one type of tooth. These are pointed enough to grasp slippery fish but strong enough to crush turtle shells. Sharks too have only sharp, jagged teeth, but they have three rows of them. But teeth are used for much more than brutal assault. An Alaskan grizzly waits patiently for a salmon to pass by. Her weapons must be versatile if they're to be effective fishing tools. The salmon are swift and slippery, so she must use her teeth and claws with skill as well as force. After seizing her prey, she holds it in position and delicately removes the scaly skin to uncover the flesh beneath. Young bears learn these skills by watching their mother. With such efficient weapons, food is sometimes easy to come by, and a bear might catch 20 salmon a day. This leaves plenty of time for play. In some species, the weapons are not teeth and claws, but beaks and talons. Birds of prey are the ultimate aerial predators. This golden eagle is one of the best. It's a jet fighter of the bird world. Keen eyes for spotting prey. A 10 foot or three meter wingspan. And aerial agility for seizing its victim with lethal accuracy. Let's see that again. Razor-sharp talons are used to restrain the prey while the curved beak goes in for the kill. Its beak and talons are made of keratin that makes them as strong as teeth, but only half the weight.
man has had to make weapons in order to be an effective killer. Around 3,000 years ago, West Africans became the first people to smelt iron. From then on, humans have manufactured a variety of swords, knives, rapiers and axes. But 300 million years earlier, a fish already possessed a primitive sword. The two metre or six foot long Australian sawfish patrols the seafloor. An unsuspecting school of mullet approach. Once in range, its lethal weapon swings into action. Razor-like teeth on either side of the snout injure the fish and they fall to the bottom. With a movement any human swordsman would envy, the sawfish swings its snout through the water. The hunter then moves over the sea floor to eat them at leisure. If nature's underwater armoury can include swords, why not clubs? A mantis shrimp searches for a meal with eyes that sit on stalks. The shrimp may only be three inches or eight centimetres long, but he carries a pair of fearsome weapons. Behind his front legs are hidden two powerful clubs. As we use tools to smash the hard shells of seafood, so the mantis shrimp uses his bludgeons to beat his victim to death. Each strike takes just one fiftieth of a second. That's faster than any human movement ever recorded. Blow after blow is rained down on the crab until its protective shell is shattered and its body dismembered. The mantis shrimp then dines on fresh crab meat. The first weapons made by humans were wooden spears sharpened with stone, similar to those still used today by Australian Aborigines. But insects invented this technology long before we did. Every night, insects using spears kill more humans than any other animal on the planet. The female mosquito has an elongated mouth part that's protected by a flexible sheath. Within the sheath, two pairs of serrated sores slice into the victim's skin and tap into blood capillaries. A chemical in the mosquito saliva stops the blood from clotting. To most of us, this blood sucker is merely irritating. But to others, it's lethal. Over a million people a year are infected with the malaria parasite. The advantage of spears and arrows over clubs and swords is that they allow the hunter to kill from a distance. Animals were aware of this well before man discovered it. The chameleon catches its prey with a long fleshy tongue that can extend twice the lizard's body length. Now let's see how the weapon's employed. Muscles in the mouth contract, so the tongue shoots out like a spear. Just before impact, the tip of the tongue contracts to form a suction cup, which fastens around its prey. And with the weapon dispatched in just one twentieth of a second, the chameleon strike gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, fast food.
there's a marine hunter that kills by harpoon. The cone shell searches the passing current for food with its siphon. This conceals a tiny arrow armed with sharp cutting barbs and tipped with lethal poison. Once a potential prey is near enough, a marksman's aim is taken and the arrow fired. Take a look at that in slow motion. It hits the target with deadly precision and the fish is paralysed within seconds. Once harpooned, the victim is reeled in and swallowed whole. It was 13,000 years ago that man first learnt to weave twine and make nets to catch food. But spiders have been using nets for over 200 million years. The Australian net casting spider weaves a catching device quite different to the traditional orb web. She hangs down and pulls the silk from her abdomen at a rate of 200 strokes a minute. This silk is twice as elastic as conventional spider silk. The net is then poised between her front legs and she positions herself, ready for ambush. is then wrapped in a silk cocoon before being paralysed with deadly venom. Every snare humans have ever built has a prototype in nature. Animals live in a world full of traps where victims are caught before they know it. The worm larva of the tiger beetle lives inside a pit trap made out of sand. The larva is only one third of an inch or one centimetre long, but it's a formidable killer that can strike in one fifth of a second. Its head is covered in spines with two pincers for dragging victims into its trap. Ants and caterpillars are easy prey. Once caught, they're dismembered using sharp jaws. This ladybird gets lucky. It's too big for the worm larva to handle and makes an escape. There's an Australian animal that also builds a trap. The trapdoor spider builds a burrow three feet or one metre deep. It sleeps at the bottom but comes to the top to feed. Trip lines made of silk allow the spider to detect the vibrations of passing insects with its feet. It can sense with total precision whether a passerby is a potential meal. It pulls the animal into its trap and injects venom with large downward striking fangs. The prey is immobilised and eaten by being sucked dry. It's all very well being equipped with an incredible diversity of weapons, but they're useless without the right ammunition. in the animal arms race. And the ammunition of animals comes in many forms. Projectiles, bombs, poison and a whole lot more. You name it, they've got it. And they know how to use it.
We humans first started loading metal bullets into guns around 700 years ago. But nature's been firing rounds for millions of years. The South American archer fish has extended its hunting ground to above the water. As the fish sneaks up on its prey, its position is masked by reflections. Once the target is in its sights, the archer fish makes adjustments for the different refractive properties of water and air. It then takes aim and fires. The water ejects because the fish presses its tongue against a groove on the roof of its mouth to form the barrel of a pistol. Explosive force is provided not by a trigger, but by rapid compression of the gills. The result is a gun that fires water bullets at 19 feet or 6 metres per second. At distances of around 3 feet or a metre, the aim of the archer fish is nearly always lethal. An African sharpshooter uses different ammunition. The larva of the antlion butterfly digs a conical pit and transforms it into a trap. It ejects any large particles so that the pit walls contain only fine sand. This makes it difficult for trapped insects to climb out. It then buries itself and waits with open jaws. Once it's fallen into the trap, this ant has little chance of scaling the walls. But the antlion makes sure by flicking sand at its prey. The antlion may only be a third of an inch or one centimetre long, but it has an especially strong neck that enables it to fire sand bullets at an astonishing speed for such a small animal. Eventually, the ant becomes exhausted and the ant lion drags it under the sand. It injects poison and digestive juices before sucking the ant dry. The ant lion is a tidy housekeeper. It catapults the empty body husk out of the pit. A few adjustments to the deadly sand trap and it's ready for the next victim. One of the most effective tools in the hunter's armoury is the lure. Human fishermen were casting their first lines 100,000 years ago. They cut hooks out of bone and used a variety of bait. But there's a reptile that's been fishing with lure and bait for 60 million years. The football-sized American snapping turtle feeds by holding its mouth open and using its own tongue as a lure. The small piece of flesh mimics the movement of a worm something these goby fish find irresistible. If the tongue is the ammunition, then the mouth is the weapon. Once the prey is inside, massive jaws slam shut like a steel trap. Bolas spider uses a single thread of silk as her fishing line. The bait is a sticky globule. It's scented with the same chemical female moths use to lure a male partner. When the male moth homes in on the scent, it approaches. As soon as the spider detects the vibration of wings, it starts swinging for its supper. The 
movement of the globule or bolas fools the moth into believing it's a female moth in flight. The confidence trick works. The spider gets its meal and the moth ends up in the arms of a very different female from the one it set out to meet. Back on the ground, the black widow spider also employs sticky strands of silk to catch its prey. This notorious killer sets a series of lines on the ground and attaches beads of sticky glue. Oil secreted from its feet prevents the spider sticking to its own trap. A venomous scorpion gets stuck on one of the trip lines. Despite tugging, it fails to break free. Weight for weight, spider silk is twice as elastic as steel and five times stronger. The spider comes to claim its prize, but the scorpion's sting is as lethal as the spider's bite. The scene is set for a dramatic battle. The spider wins by wrapping its victim in silk to immobilise its tail. The scorpion is killed with a bite that packs potent venom. It was around 40,000 years ago that human hunters learnt to use poison to immobilise their prey. Some tribes, such as these Kalahari Bushmen, still do so today. Many snakes have been using chemical warfare for millions of years. The fangs of the puff adder are larger than most snakes, so more venom is injected. This mouse doesn't stand a chance. Let's see that again. The attack lasts just 1 25th of a second. Adder venom is made up of powerful hemotoxins that break down the victim's blood vessels. For the victim, death occurs in minutes due to internal bleeding. One primitive sea creature has been relying on venom to catch its prey for 300 million years. The Portuguese man of war has stinging tentacles that can extend as much as 160 feet or 50 metres. Each tentacle is armed from end to end with clusters. The surface of each cluster is covered in tiny trap doors. Behind each door is a coiled sting. Fish that come near do so at their own peril. As the fish struggles, the tentacles contract to bring more stinging cells in contact with its body. Once prey is killed, the stomach of the Portuguese man of war extends to envelop it. Digestive fluids then reduce the fish to liquid. The man of war kills its prey with hundreds of stings. But there's one organism that inflicts millions of stings. Army ants of Central and Southern America live in colonies with up to a quarter of a million individuals. The workers search for food by marching out into the leaf litter in long columns. The ants are blind, but they stay in formation by laying scent for those behind to follow. Once potential prey has been found, it's bitten and injected with venom. Within seconds, the victim is overwhelmed by sheer weight of numbers. This is death by a million stings.
Each worker ant has sharp mouth parts that can cut, slice and dismember prey, no matter how large it is. With such great numbers, formidable weapons and potent ammunition, this army can kill 50,000 animals in one day. Along with bullets, bait and poison, another form of ammunition is brute strength. And whilst humans can appear strong and agile, most of our physical skills are surpassed by animals. This African beet python uses powerful muscles to suffocate a rat, but it's strong enough to crush a person's skull. The peregrine falcon uses a mixture of wing power and speed to stun its prey. By attacking at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour, that's 160 kilometers, it knocks this grouse clean out of the air. When it comes to speed, humans aren't in the same league. And as for agility, birds of prey can outmaneuver not only us, but almost any competition. The sea eagle is a masterpiece of aerodynamic design. Found on several continents, these aerial warriors have an 8-foot or 3-metre wingspan, razor-sharp talons and a beak like a meat cleaver. But their ammunition isn't power, but aerial agility. threats out there, animals need a means of protection. Penguins go for safety in numbers. For many reptiles, it pays to be thick-skinned. Other animals take the prickly approach. Being soft-skinned, we humans understand the concept of defence. If we're going to engage in a fight, it pays to encase ourselves in protective armour. Or use a shield to ward off blows. Animals also utilise armour plating. Crabs live inside a hard shell. Beetles possess a thick exoskeleton made from the protein chitin, a rigid, flexible and light compound. This predatory tiger beetle hasn't got a hope of penetrating the ladybird's armour. So what happens when two beetles engage in combat? Male stag beetles commonly fight for the right to mate with a female. The males possess giant biting mouth parts or mandibles so each must be built like a tank to prevent injury. Beetles are one of nature's toughest customers. 280 million years ago, their front wings evolved into hard protective cases. These protect the animal from drying out and ultraviolet radiation. Now meet the ultimate insect tank. Believe it or not, it's a caterpillar. It's so rare it doesn't have a common name. Lifara bristleus lives with weaver ants in tropical Australia. Weaver ants usually prey on caterpillars, but biting mouthparts and acid spray guns are useless against the leathery covering that surrounds this body. The armoured caterpillar gate crashes the ant's nest to eat their larvae. All 
the residents can do is make threatening gestures. Once established in the nest, the caterpillar is impossible to remove. Even when it pupates, it remains safe inside its armour plating. You'd think when the butterfly emerges, it would be vulnerable. Think again. Its wings and legs are covered with shiny, loose scales. Any ant trying to get a grip simply slides off. The butterfly's body is covered with hairs that clog up the ant's mouth. The butterfly leaves the nest unharmed. Another defence strategy is to have spikes and spines. Few predators will risk attacking the European hedgehog or the Australian echidna. Whilst caterpillars are a favourite food of birds, they also use spikes and bristles to avoid being eaten. The flamboyant looking lionfish isn't just spiny, it's venomous. Several of these spines are poisonous. Lionfish are immune to their own venom, but they still use their spines during territorial fights. A darker coloured male enters the territory. The lighter coloured male decides it's time to act. The warriors jostle as each tries to get into a position to spear the other. Whilst the spines won't kill, they can still inflict serious injury. The intruder wins. The loser must relinquish his territory or risk being stabbed to death. In the last few hundred years, we humans have learnt to use toxins to protect our crops and livestock against insect pests. But animals have been using chemical defences against their enemies for millions of years. Central and South America are home to the world's only venomous frogs. These Costa Rican tree frogs exude a poison from their skin. The venom is so lethal that several South American tribes use it for hunting. Hence the name poison dart frog. Caterpillars have also evolved to be poisonous, although they rarely manufacture toxins themselves. Instead, they feed on poisonous plants, turning the plant's defences to their own advantage. By feeding together, these lace-winged caterpillars also gain safety in numbers. Many animals display warning colours to put off potential predators. This sends a signal that they're poisonous or distasteful to eat. It's one of the reasons nature is so colourful. But not every poisonous creature adopts a passive approach. When confronted by a potential predator, this rogue beetle raises its tail and lets out an invisible but unpleasant smell. The bombardier beetle goes one step further. He creates a bodily explosion. From a special gland at the top of its abdomen, the bombardier fires off a cocktail of poisonous chemicals. For the pursuing wolf spider, it's a very effective deterrent. But it's snakes that display the most aggressive use of chemical defence. When confronted by an enemy, the spitting cobra expands the hood around its neck 
by moving elongated ribs unique to cobras. This makes it look more threatening. Just before spitting, the cobra collapses its lungs so that a rush of air shoots the venom out. It fires the venom directly at the eyes of its victim, where it irritates the cornea and causes temporary blindness. If you don't have your own chemical defence, it's a good idea to make friends with someone who does. These fish can live amongst the stinging tentacles of the jellyfish because they have a protective mucus shield. Clownfish get together with stinging anemones. Both creatures benefit from the association. The anemone gains a bodyguard and the clownfish gets a refuge. If a potential predator approaches, the clownfish dives for cover. A wise hunter knows not to follow. Spines also make good protection. So this tiny jellyfish piggybacks on a spine of the needle sea urchin. The jellyfish wraps around the spine and lets out sticky feeding tentacles that act like fishing lines. One tentacle has snared a little shrimp, another a lobster larva. The meals are drawn inside the jellyfish to be digested. Caterpillars also form partnerships for defence. The imperial blue is found only on acacia trees that are also home to colonies of ants. Although ants usually eat caterpillars, it's a different story this time. The ants protect the caterpillar because it bribes them with honeydew secreted from a gland on its rear. The ants gain a meal from an endless honeydew fountain the caterpillar recruits bodyguards. If you can't find protection by getting together with another animal, there's always safety in numbers. That's why humans aren't the only species to form societies and find refuge in groups. Nature is full of teamwork. The ocean is packed with hunters, so fish gather together or school, not only to hide behind each other, but also as an organised defence system. The synchronised motion and the translucent colouring of a school confuses would-be predators. highly effective means of defence is trickery. Trickery involves the communication of false information. The secret here is for the deceiver to be aware of another individual's needs. That way it can trick it into getting what it wants. Both children and apes become capable of deceit at around 18 months of age. Even at that early age, they've learnt how to conceal, manipulate and distract. Scientists have identified four levels of trickery. Level one is appearance. In the underhand world of animals, subterfuge and deception take many forms. The most complex is calculated trickery. The simplest is camouflage. And we humans have got a lot to learn. Animals are far better at it than us. The idea is to look like your surroundings so that predators don't spot you. 
Most caterpillars are masters of camouflage. Some look like a leaf, others like the damaged midrib of a leaf. Some even pretend to be a pile of rubbish. Snakes get in on the act too. The African green mamba is hard to spot in the tree canopy. The gaboon viper blends in with the leaf litter. The underwater world has countless places to hide. Many fish survive by blending into the background. And sometimes it's hard to tell what's alive and what's not. The ocean has creatures that use camouflage not just for defence, but for attack. The frogfish only moves to grab a meal. Another master of ambush camouflage is the anglerfish. The tasseled anglerfish masquerades as a plant. But make no mistake, it's a carnivore. It's so fast that surrounding fish aren't even aware of its presence until it's too late. fish can even ingest animals its own size. Let's see that again. The strike takes just one twentieth of a second. And once in the mouth, the prey is secured by inward curving teeth. Camouflaged creatures rely on their looks alone to deceive. But some tricksters fool others by their actions. The scales of butterflies come in a variety of colours. One side may be plain, the other flamboyant. The butterfly keeps its wings folded for concealment, but it can flash bright colours to confuse a would-be predator. In some species, the sudden appearance of Big, bright eye spots scares off the hunter. In others, the movement of false antenna at the rear will deflect an attack away from the butterfly's real head at the front. The female Clytra beetle employs a whole series of tricks to get what she wants. On laying her egg, she sculpts it so that it doesn't look like a beetle egg. A fake chemical attractant completes the illusion. She then deliberately drops it near a wood ant's nest, knowing full well they'll find the smell irresistible. The ants think the egg is one of their own and take it deep into their nest, to the safest place of all, the ant nursery. The beetle egg hatches into a carnivorous scrub protected from ant attack by a hardened case made from nest debris. From inside its mobile fortress, the Clytra grub preys at will on ants and their larvae. While the grub consumes whole generations at a sitting, the ants can do nothing about it. The most sophisticated form of trickery involves modification of behaviour to deceive others. What we're talking about is acting. We humans started acting around 100,000 years ago and it was associated with an increase in brain size. 
animals with much smaller brains were putting on performances long before we did. When confronted with a threat, this grass snake acts dead. It not only feigns the look of death, it also gives off a decaying smell from its tail. Once the danger's passed, it miraculously recovers. An Oscar-winning performance. Rattlesnakes warn off intruders by making a menacing noise. But so do fake rattlesnakes. The gopher snake looks like a venomous rattlesnake, but is completely harmless. It impersonates the rattler by scraping its tail along the ground. It even hisses to enhance the illusion. Another form of trickery is distraction. When this mother killdeer bird senses a threat to her young, she goes into her act. First, she moves away from her nest and pretends it's in another spot. She's hoping to lure the threat towards her and away from her chicks. This time it doesn't work, so she resorts to her next trick. She calls out as if she's hurt and vulnerable. Surely this will lure the hunter. Not this time, so the real show begins. She fakes a broken wing. This should fool the potential predator into believing that she's easy meat and pursue her and not her young. Of course, these beachgoers are no threat to her or her young, but the killdeer wasn't to know this. Male crickets call to attract a mate, and a female mates with the male who sings the sweetest song. But using sound to alert others to your presence has its drawbacks. It may attract a rival or even a parasitic fly. So some males don't call at all, but use trickery to get a mate. They sneak up behind a calling male and sit very quietly. Once the female comes close enough, the silent male mimics the call of the other cricket and pretends that the love serenade was his all along. She falls for it and he jumps at the chance to mate. The duped male must wonder what went wrong. In the world of hunter and hunted, prey has a better chance of surviving if it can fool the predator. These impalas may seem vulnerable to attack. They're actually engaged in a game of deception. When an impala is pursued by a lion, instead of running away, it deliberately slows down and jumps in the air. This behaviour is called stotting. The impala is signalling to the lion that it feels secure enough to toy with it. The lion reads this as a sign of superiority because a slow or weak animal wouldn't dare do this. Both predator and prey profit by this behaviour. The impala isn't chased and the lion doesn't waste energy pursuing an animal it has little chance of capturing. It's known as double deception. In the animal arms race, the relationship between predator and prey has reached extraordinary levels of sophistication. Nature invented most forms of warfare long before we humans did. Yet the overall destruction caused by the animal arms race has been minimal. It's only humans who have the potential for mass destruction. So maybe we need to learn from nature. If survival and sustainability is our ultimate goal, animals did it first.